start recording. More examples on Lagrange. Again, we're treating Lagrange. Our examples at the moment are all considering particles. What I, uh, yeah, as time permits, I've got three, three examples here we could try. Let's see how many we'll get through. We'll get through at least two of them. I'm gonna stick, stick with the pendulum. Now I wanna do a double pendulum. Once you see the double pendulum, you could easily say I could have a, uh, an end length pendulum extended as far as you like. But we'll just do two. So here's my pendulum. It has, uh, I'm trying to decide in my example if I have, I think in this case I'm using some symmetry here. So for simplicity, I'm going to call this length L and that length L. And I'm going to call that mass M and that mass M. This would be a good example. This is going to be really good. Probably one of my favorites for just showing all the little pieces of Lagrange that fit together. Let's let this angle be theta. And it's, I'm free to choose it. But in this case, I'm gonna choose the relative angle here to be phi. It's up to you. You could let that be an absolute angle. You could let it be a relative angle. In this case, notice I've drawn this second pendular, pendulum angle in a relative fashion. I'm gonna define coordinate systems. I'll call this N1, N2. This is B1, B2, and this is C1, C2. Step zero, I need my generalized force, or coordinate, excuse me, generalized coordinates. So in this case, I can see that it's a two DOF system. So that means I need two generalized coordinates. If I add more generalized coordinates, I'll need constraints. And at the moment, you might say, well, how would I handle the constraints? Well, I would first write the generalized coordinates, I'd write the constraints, then I would rewrite the generalized coordinates with the constraints applied. That would reduce me to the number that I need. Uh, in, you know, I can choose different ones, but it looks to me like theta and phi seem kind of obvious there, and they describe all the motions, so I say we go with those. What else could I use? Well, I could use the x displacement. I could say that's x1, and I could use x2. I could use other things. I could use perhaps frequency, something like that, I suppose. I'm not sure how. I really typically treat these problems with coordinates that make sense, and they're typically kinematic coordinates to me. Step one, I need energies of my system. So now we're gonna see how we treat energies if we have more than one body. I can see before I jump into writing the energies, I'm gonna need both the position and the velocity of each of those particles, so let's get them. Um, I'm gonna call that guy one and that guy two. Excuse me. So R1, R1 is a negative L on the B2, R2 is negative L on the B2 minus L on the C2. The velocity of particle one is the derivative of that thing in the body fixed frame, which is zero, plus the angular velocity. You know, I'm gonna need the angular velocity of two and three, so let's get those first. So I need the angular velocity of B with respect to N, that's theta, looks like that's theta dot around the B3. I need the angular velocity of C with respect to N, looks like that's the angular velocity around the B3 of theta dot, plus the angular velocity of phi 
dot on the C3. Now, as a quick aside, if I instead would have made this phi be the absolute measure, then my angular velocity of C with respect to N would just be the phi dot. It wouldn't have a theta dot term in it. Now I need the velocities. So the velocity of body one, it's the derivative in the B frame, which is zero plus the omega B to N crossed with R1. So that's gonna be a three cross a two gives me a negative one. So I get a negative times a negative, it's just positive L theta dot in the B1. My V2. It's going to be first the derivative in the, oh, it's in a mixture of B and C frames. That's okay. Zero in the B and C frames plus the angular velocity of B crossed with this guy. So I just did that once. So it's going to be plus L theta dot in the B1. Um, and then I get uh, the second term. So I need the angular velocity of C with respect to N crossed with this guy. C3 and the B3 are both the same direction, so I'm gonna get a uh, theta dot plus phi dot in the C3 cross a C2, that's a negative C1, but I got a negative L, so it's a plus L in the C1. So that's my velocity. Now, as a quick aside, I'm gonna have to take the I'm gonna have to take the derivative, I'm gonna have to take the dot product of V2. I'm gonna have to dot V2 with itself. And notice it's in the B and the C frame. So I need to convert it from either the B frame or the C frame or vice versa. This guy's already in the B frame. So I'm gonna project this guy from the B frame from the C frame back to the B frame. So I'm gonna use my rotation that takes me from the C back to the B, that's a rotation around the three by phi. So it's cos phi minus sine phi zero, sine phi cos phi zero, 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 one. I'm gonna pre-multiply this guy and that will give me um, L theta dot plus L theta dot plus phi dot times the cosine of phi, that's in the B1 direction. I'm going to get a L theta dot plus phi dot times the sine phi in the B2 direction and then zero in the B3. So that's in the B. Okay. Now I'm ready for energy. Uh, that was kinematics. Now I'm ready for energy. So T, it's, uh, I'm gonna need the sum, one half M sub I, V sub I dotted with V sub I, for I equal one to N, and N is two. So first I get one half M1 times V dot, V1 dot with V1, which is L theta dot, in the B1 times L theta dot in the B1, which is L squared theta dot squared. This was V1 dotted with V1. Plus one half M2, V2 dotted with V2. And that is I gotta dot this whole thing. So I'm gonna get uh, L squared theta dot squared plus L squared theta dot plus phi dot quantity squared cos phi squared plus two L squared theta dot times 
theta plus phi dot times cos phi. Plus, I need the second term, L squared theta dot squared plus phi dot squared. Oops. Theta dot plus phi dot squared sine squared phi. I'm going to rewrite that again. That's uh, one half m1 L squared theta dot squared plus one half M2. Say again, L squared, I can pull the L squared out. I get theta dot squared plus theta dot plus phi dot squared plus two theta dot theta dot plus phi dot cos phi. Okay, that's my T. A little bit messy. But that's okay. Now I need my V, my kinetic energy. And that's going to be, I'm going to have to sum the two. So I'm going to sum over both bodies. So I'll get kinetic energy the first. That's going to be, uh, and again, my reference is going to be up here. My reference is, uh, I'm choosing E is zero up here. So I'll get negative energies from both these guys in the current configuration. I say negative. Um, yeah, because my, you know, my reference is going down. So I'm going to get negative M1 G L cos theta. You know, by the way, I think I let M1 equal M2. I don't know why I separated that out. So I'm going to start dropping my Ms. Well, I'll carry it through with the T V and then I'll start dropping them. So it's negative MGL cos theta. And then I need the position of the second one. And it looks like it's going to be um, negative, M, uh, negative M2 times G L cos theta plus G L cos theta plus phi. All right, I can, I'm going to rewrite that once. It's going to be a negative MGL cos theta, well, I guess two cos theta, right, plus cos theta plus V. And from here on out, I'll let M1 equal M2. All right, so now I need to do components. So first I'm going to let J, I'm going to let J equal one, which means my Q sub one equals theta. So I need the partial of T with respect to theta. When I look across my T, I don't have any, so it's zero. Then I need the partial of T with respect to theta dot. I'm gonna look across my T. I can see I have a couple of those. So first I've got two of these, theta dot. So I'm gonna get two ML squared theta dot. Uh, the second term is gonna give me plus ML squared theta dot plus phi dot. And then finally the last one, I'll get ML squared 
theta dot plus phi dot cos phi. I need the DDT of the partial of T with respect to theta dot. So that's going to give me a minus 2 ml squared theta double dot. I don't know if I said negative. I hope I didn't say negative. It's 2 ml squared theta double dot plus ml squared theta double dot plus phi double dot plus ml squared theta double dot plus phi double dot cos phi plus theta dot plus phi dot times phi dot sine phi. And it looks like I need a negative in that there. Next, I need the partial of T with respect, excuse me, the partial of V with respect to theta. And when I look at this guy, I get minus MGL minus two sine theta minus sine theta plus V. I'm gonna take the minuses out and get positive MGL. And my cap Q sub theta, these are forces that are non-conservative. I've got gravity that's conservative and not constraints. I go back and look at my double pendulum. See the force I'd have would be gravity, those conservative. I'd have these tensions, those are constraints. So I don't have any. Zero. All right. Let's look at J equal two. For J equal two, Q two equals phi. Start through, first up. Partial of T with respect to phi. Well, I actually have a phi term. So that is, um, I'm gonna get a minus because it's a cosine minus one half ML squared. Oh, but there's the two, so I'm gonna drop that out. Start over. So I get minus ML squared theta dot times theta dot plus phi dot times sine of phi. Next, I get the partial of T with respect to phi dot. First term, none. Second term, none. Third term, I get ML squared theta dot plus phi dot plus, I get an ML squared out of that, so plus theta dot cos phi. Uh, something just happened here. Sure. Sorry about that. Not sure what happened. So I'm taking the partial with respect to phi. So I get this term to one, two times one half ML squared theta dot plus phi dot. And then I get this guy. So the two comes out two times one half ML squared uh, theta dot plus, let's see, I'm taking the derivative with respect to phi. So it's just a theta dot times cosine phi. Uh, I need the DDT of the partial of T with respect to phi dot. Gives me ML squared theta double dot plus phi double dot plus theta double dot cos phi minus theta dot phi dot sine phi. And I need the partial of V with respect to phi. Looks like I get a positive mg 
L sine theta plus phi. I need cap Q sub phi using the same argument as before. <clears throat> I get zero. There is no derivative, there is no non conservative, non constrained forces. Now, step three, I'm ready to assemble Lagrange. And I will have how many Lagrange's equations? I have one for each J or one for each generalized coordinate. So I'll get two. That's why I've kind of drawn them out in this way. I get one here and one here. One on each side. So on the left, I get the uh, first, I get the DDT of the partial T with respect to Q sub J. So I get, uh, see if I can pull all this stuff out. I get ML squared times two theta double dot plus theta double dot plus phi double dot plus theta double dot plus phi double dot cos phi minus theta dot plus phi dot times the quantity phi dot sine phi. That's my first term. I get a mar minus the partial of t with respect to theta dot, so I get minus ML squared times two theta dot. Oh, no, I'm looking at the wrong thing. My mistake. The partial of t with respect to theta, so minus zero. Plus the partial of t with respect to theta, partial of v with respect to theta, plus MGL times two sine theta plus sine theta plus V, and that whole thing equals zero. So that's my first equation. Second equation, I need the DDT of the partial T with respect to phi dot, gives me ML squared theta double dot plus phi double dot plus theta double dot cos phi minus theta dot phi dot sine phi. Minus the partial t with respect to phi. So it gives me minus this thing. So that's a plus ml squared theta dot theta dot plus phi dot sine phi. Plus partial of e with respect to phi. So that's plus mg l sine theta plus phi equals Q sub theta, which is zero. So here I have two equations, two, two equations of motion, two generalized coordinates, you know, two, yeah, two second order differential equations to be solved for the unknowns. I could combine some things here uh, that could be done. I think I will go one more step. Let's rewrite in matrix form. Let's see if I allowed myself much room here. So I'm going to rewrite it in terms of my two unknowns. So I'm going to rewrite it this way. So the first equation, the coefficients of my theta double dot are going to be. Um, ML squared, so I get three plus cos phi coefficient of phi double dot looks like it's uh, ML squared times one plus cos phi. You know, this is a lot larger than I need to be. I need this room. Next, I'll have my Coriolis terms 
and I'm just going to write those down. So I'll get an ML squared minus theta dot plus V dot V dot sine phi. Then I'll get an MGL two sine theta plus sine phi plus theta plus phi. Oh, and then I've got a math question here. Let me, let me finish what I'm on and I'll come answer that. And then that equals zero. And I do the same, I guess I'm getting a little bogged down here. Let me just write part of the second one. Part of the second one, I get an ML squared. Uh, it looks like I get a one plus cos phi. The phi double dot gives me an ML squared. Looks like just an ML squared. And then I get other terms. I get a minus ML squared theta dot phi dot sine phi. plus ML squared theta dot, theta dot plus phi dot sine phi. I can see some of this stuff would actually simplify. And I get an MGLS theta plus phi. Okay, a little messy, um, but here I've written it in terms of our theta double dot and phi double dot, which you can solve for explicitly, you know, just by inverting this left-hand matrix. Okay, I'm gonna end this example, um, this example, but there's a question. Why do I get a phi dot when, di when differentiating with respect to theta and vice versa? Okay, uh, gosh, um, BTC, I'm not trying to remind me who BTC, I think that's the conference room maybe. Anyhow, that's sure your answer that asked this question. So can you tell me what line I got a phi dot Oh, Jason. Ah, Jason. Okay. Okay, Jason. Um, what, what line did I get the phi dot when differentiating? So, so, okay. So up here, Jason, let's look at this. Let's look at this line here. So here I'm taking the partial of T with respect to phi. But notice I've got a theta dot and a phi dot. So let's go back up and look at the T right here. So I've got to take the derivative of this thing with respect to phi itself. So the first term, I'm gonna use my eraser as a marker. My first term doesn't have any phi in it. So there's no derivative there. Let's look at my second term. Now it's this thing times all these components. No phi in here, no phi in here. But look, there's a phi here. So I gotta take the derivative of one half ML squared times two theta dot theta dot plus phi dot cosine phi. So I just have, it's all of this times the derivative of the cosine of phi. The derivative of cosine of phi is a minus sine phi. So I get a minus sine phi and then I get ML squared times theta dot times the quantity of theta dot plus phi dot. So that's, that's where these components come in because I got cosine phi times this other stuff. So I just copied this stuff and then wrote down the sine phi. Dr. Canfield, can I ask a question on that same one? This is Kevin. Yep, go ahead, Kevin. So how come a, a phi dot didn't pop out of that when you did the derivative? Well, right now I'm looking at the DDT of the, or excuse me, the, I'm looking at the partial of T with respect to phi. Okay, that's all. Okay. So, you know, I just get some, some, something in this case that's constant times the cosine of phi, times the derivative of the cosine of phi. Or, excuse me, the d d phi of the cosine of phi. That is minus sine phi. When I go to the next one, now I'm taking the derivative of respect to phi dot. So no phi dot here, so that's zero. No phi dot here, that's zero. There's a phi dot here, so I get two times the quantity. So that's where the two came in. There's a phi dot here, so I get all this stuff. That's a constant, so two theta dot ML squared um, times cosine of phi. Kevin, does that make sense? 
Uh, yes, I get that part. My, my question was is previously we've, we've when we take the derivative of say a cosine of phi, we end up with phi dot cosine or sine of phi or negative negative phi dot sine ah, of phi. Ah, yeah. So here, this is this is an aside. I don't know if I left myself much room. So let's say I just had this term. T is ML squared theta dot plus phi dot cos phi. Well, if I do the DDT of cap T, I'm first, I might first take the derivative with respect to phi, but then I've got to take the derivative of phi with respect to time, okay? So that's where the phi dot would come in. In this case, I'm explicitly saying what's the partial of t with respect to phi only, okay? So the difference is I'm doing this one, not this. Does that make sense? Perfect sense, thanks. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Yeah, and that's, what, that's really what Lagrange is. Look, here I'm taking the partial with respect to theta, then the partial with respect to theta dot, then finally the DDT, finally the derivative. So it really breaks it down into steps. Yeah. So, and then Jason's saying, since theta and phi are dependent on time, I mean, they are dependent on time. That's just part of being a generalized coordinate. But frankly, I wasn't thinking that. I was looking across at t, and I was first given the task of taking the partial of t with respect to phi. So all I did was said, are there any phi terms? Okay, look, no phi terms here, no phi terms here, no phi terms here. And then here's a phi term. So I just took the derivative of this with respect to phi. So it's like a constant times the cosine of phi. It wasn't until I got down to where I said, take the DDT of this thing. So it's just these individual steps. Okay, good. Other questions, comments? All right, uh, I had said, I had big eyes, said two or three examples. Um, and we've got one, but it was pretty involved. Um, note that it was pretty involved. It was 2D, it was two bo multiple bodies, two dimension, three dimensions would add other, other complications. But so far, it wouldn't change anything. It just made our problem a little easier up in the kinematics. Uh, you see how that goes. When we get back together, I guess on Thursday, I, wanna, I do wanna finish this example out. I wanna go ahead and add, let's say I were to add some force here, just some arbitrary force. How would I include that in my queue? This one is an interesting problem. It's very helpful to me. I refer back to this example all the time. So on Thursday, we'll pick up with this example and we'll consider it for the case where I add a force right there. Okay, so that is gonna be the end of lecturing on this for today. Uh, other questions on Lagrange, the Lagrange process, these couple examples we've done so far. Okay, seeing none, I would like to jump to MATLAB for a minute. So I'm going to go ahead and open MATLAB if you, uh, if you're inspired, go ahead and open MATLAB. Obviously, I'm not giving us much time. You might just want to sit back and relax the last few minutes of this class and watch what I'm going to show you. Okay, so we are, uh, trying to spend a little bit of time on MATLAB every Tuesday. It's a powerful tool. We get these equations, you know, we get equations and, and, you know, then there's a big question of then what? Well, we could linearize this thing and proceed. And actually I'm going to do that on one of these, but you know, um, evaluating these in time, treating these more than just linearizing is stuff that I want to do. I'm going to want to solve these in time. So I need to do numerical integration. You currently are, have a MATLAB assignment as part of those MATLAB assignments and you're doing kinematics, rigid body kinematics of a block. Some of you have turned that in, but uh, we've got that hanging out there. Do we have a due date on that? 
but on on Thursday. Yeah, you said a week from this coming Thursday. A week from the all right, you got a due date on that. All right. Very good. Now I'm going to go ahead and assign, uh, give a, a next little task associated with that, or at least say, let's say there's a next little task. So here's what I want to do. If we jump back up, so we're going to do a very simple example here of um, the next thing I want to do. Here was our second example. We did the pendulum twice. The first time we treated the gravity as a generalized force. The second time we treated it as a conservative force. Oh, well, we got these equations of motion. So here I have a pendulum. I got the equations of motion. I would like to solve this in time. Can I solve this in, here's a question for you. Anyone wants to chime in? Look how simple that is. I can solve this in closed form, easy peasy, right? True or false? Sam, what do you think, true or false? No, you weren't. I'm just you said, can you solve it easily? <laughs> okay, let me give my answer. No, I cannot solve this easily. Okay, why not? Because it's got sine theta. It was a trick question, all right? It's got sine theta. If that were theta, if I made the small angle assumption, it would be easy peasy. Well, okay, hold on a second. I did show you an easy peasy way, but I'm thinking solving it in time, okay? The answer that I'm thinking in my head is it's not easy because I got this sine theta. It's not theta double dot and a theta, it's theta double dot and a sine theta. So there's no, no closed form solution. There are these, this method using elliptic integrals that people use. So there's this intermediate solution and frankly, I mean, I don't really do that much. So there's not a closed, there's not a closed form solution to this. You could do face portraits, okay? You could, it would be easy to do face portraits. That would give you theta versus theta dot. You could see how it moved, not in time, but in that face space. Uh, you can't solve it exactly in time. So if I said, where's my pendulum 32 seconds in the future? Exactly, or as exact as I can get. I've got to go to a numerical solution. That's all I'm trying to say. And again, the complication is the nonlinearity here in this. And by the way, let's look at the double pendulum. I mean, if that one, if that one's, if this single pendulum's hard, let's look at the double pendulum. I mean, it's nightmares, right? Look at all those terms. But the method that I'm about to show you stays the same in either case. We're gonna treat this numerically. Okay, so I wanna solve it in time. So I go to MATLAB, how do I wanna do that? Well, um, I write a new script. I just hit the plus, it just made me a new script. Or I could have gone new script. So I want to, here I'm talking about integrating equations in time. So I wanna make a little sample program to integrate equations of motion forward in time. This example is gonna use MATLAB's uh, solvers. And, it, and MATLAB calls it its suite of ODE solvers. If you went up here to help, or wherever you go to help and typed ODE, it would give you a full suite of ODE solvers. And MATLAB, you gotta know about MATLAB even to figure out the help. Um, we just want regular old MATLAB, so you dig through here, probably this one. So they get their ODE solvers, and they'll give a table. They got all these solvers. So you can dig through that. Uh, that's what I want to show our little example. So to do an ODE solver, let's do, um, there's a bunch of them, but I'm going to use the ODE 4-5. So it solves non-stiff differential equations. And here's the syntax. So I give it a, um, the function, a time span, an initial conditions, and any options if I wanna have them. So this is the format that I'm gonna use, okay, to solve it. So I come down into my example and I'm just gonna paste that. So it says T and Y. I'm gonna use X rather than Y. I'm gonna use cap X rather than Y. And so that means I'm gonna send it X zero rather than Y. So this problem, I'm gonna solve here my pendulum. 
and to solve, my x is going to be my uh, state space variable. So originally, I had my um, I had q. My generalized coordinate was just my theta. So my state space variable x is going to be uh, theta and theta dot. So I need an x zero. That's the initial condition. So let's say I can just really I can just define it wherever. But I can let my x zero equal. I'll start it at some initial theta and some initial theta dot. So let's say I released it at like 30 degrees. I'm going to convert that to radians and zero. Uh, and I know I'm jumping around here. Bear with me. I'm just going to try to type this in and we can run it. Then we can go back and talk about it. I've got six minutes to do all of this. So that's my initial condition. Uh, I will need this DTR equal pi over 180. And I said we should always clear the workspace. Now, I need a T span and I need a X zero. T span is my time. Um, and I can just put it in here. So I'm going to put it in as some initial time and some final time. That'll basically, this will make an array. I think that'll force it to an array that goes from zero to 100. Okay. Um, I think if I were to just say t-span equal, no, I think it'll recognize that as going from a span of zero to 100 seconds. And then finally, I need the ODE function, and that's the name of a function that I'm going to call that has the solution to it. So in this case, you know, this is part of Mat MATLAB's, this is this function handler thingy at and then a function name that I define, and I'm gonna make my function name be pendulum. Okay, so here uh, I've got uh, pendulum is my function that has the equations of motion, and, uh, and then I got t-span and the others. And that's it, so uh, that's it for this code. And when I'm done, I get the solution. We can look at the solution. That means, though, I need to create this function pendulum, okay? So I'm going to come up here. I'm going to say new function, and this new function is going to be pendulum. And the input arguments are going to be time and x. It's the same that we're here, and the output argument is going to be just the updated x0, which I'll call dx. Okay, so these are my pendulum DOMs. Now I had these. over here. So it's a uh, theta double dot, let's just remember that theta double dot equals negative MGL S theta. Okay, so hope you guys can help me remember that. Um, so the first thing I have is that my X DX sub one, which is my D, my time derivative of my first term, x, is x dot. So that's just x2. It's always going to be that way. That one's easy. And then dx sub 2 is then theta double dot. So this is my theta dot. And then this one is my theta double dot. I'll call it d dot. And theta double dot was negative. Let's see. It was... Uh, I'm going to peek at it one more time. Theta double dot is negative. M's canceled. G over L sine theta. So it's G over L sine theta.
Now, I don't have a theta. What's theta? Theta is the first term of my x, my state variable. So that's it. Oh, and I need to define, um, I need to define G and L. So at this point, I'm just going to do it right in this function. So G is 9.81. It's a little clunky. I'll show you a better way later. L, we need L is some length. Let's just make it 10. And then um, uh, I think that's all we need. You know what? There is something goofy. It's going to make this uh, guy be a uh, row vector versus a column vector. So I'm going to boot it into a column vector. We can come back and talk about that later too, obviously. Short on time here. So I'm gonna let, I'm gonna force uh, dx to be a column vector. So it's gonna be two rows, one column. The other way to do that is to just take dx, the transpose of it. All right, so I need to save this guy. So I'm gonna save it as pendulum, which is the function name that this guy is looking for. And then this guy can just save <coughs> in whatever name I want. So this is my uh, solve my pendulum dynamics. So I'm gonna run it and uh, it ran. Oh, I kept printing DX to the screen because I didn't comment that out. So I'm gonna comment that out and save it. I'm gonna go back over here, hit run, and it doesn't show anything. Now, let's look at the result. The results are T and time and X. So time, these are just the time steps that it used in solving. Let's look at X. X is the uh, my state, so I get x0 and x1. So I want to uh, plot, I want to plot my result. So my result's going to be, um, let's plot time along the x-axis, and then it's going to be x all rows first column, that's my displacement. And let's put that in um, degrees. So I'm just going to divide. So that's going to be my, this is going to be plot my, and I could have a title. Okay, so let's run this again. And look, I can see. I can't see. I can see that I get my pendulum starting out at 30 degrees, swinging in a six, you know, a, what a periodic fashion from positive 30 to negative 30 back and forth, just as I expect as I would expect for this perfect example. And it should go on and do that, you know, forever. I mean, it's a real simple example, but I'm showing you how to do that. Obviously, we need to spend more time on it, but what do you expect for 10 minutes? Okay, we are truly out of time. Uh, I have time for a question or so on MATLAB, and then I'm gonna shut this down, but I'll be right here if you wanna talk more about this. I'll post these two examples. We'll, we'll talk about these face-to-face -face on Thursday as well. Okay, any last discussion before we close the class down? Dr. Canfield? Yep. This is Michael. I uh, just wanted to make sure uh, we weren't supposed to email you our test, were we? No, Michael, you are, if you want to email it, you can, but otherwise I'm going to collect them on Thursday. Okay. Gotcha. I'm not going to look at, I'll have your homeworks, you know, but I will not have any of the tests done for Thursday. So I'll collect them Thursday. Right. Yep. Good. Other questions. Okay, everyone. I'll be there uh, on time this Thursday. I promise. Uh, so I'll see you guys on Thursday. All right, thank you.